Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm hoping you're having a having a good day so far. Um, we've got an exciting conversation kicking off soon. We've got four wonderful guest speakers, and we're also kickstarting our campaign for Are You Safe? So we do have a lot to go through. Um, we're just waiting for a few more people to come in, but this is recorded. So if you do miss the first part, then you can revisit later or send to your um, friends' contacts whoever you think would benefit from watching this webinar. Um, so we don't want to really delay, I guess, um, too far. So we might just um, get started. So I'll just do an introduction to start things off. So again, good afternoon, welcome to this webinar. Um, and we have a special um, conversation today with our guest speakers, but it's also a very special day because today is the start of the United Nations 16 Days of Activism Against Gender Violence. Um, it's a global movement and we're participating in our own way. So uh, I'm Safe is all about empowering women. Um, we are designers of the um, I'm Safe app. Um, we do have Samson talking soon. Um, just introducing myself, I look after marketing and communications for I'm Safe. I'll be your host for today. First and foremost, I'd like to say thank you to everybody for joining us, especially our guest speakers. We really do appreciate your time, especially as we are discussing such a critical issue around women's safety, mental health, empowerment and all matters. Um, so the purpose of this webinar is not just a conversation, it's about also taking action. We want to inspire, educate and empower everybody um, individually and in communities to make a tangible difference and ensuring women everywhere is safe, whether it's at home or out and about, we do have the right to feel safe and take control of that empowerment. So we'll discuss many things. Um, we'll explore how tools, advocacy and awareness can intersect and provide um, solutions for women facing unsafe situations. So today we do have the campaign called Are You Safe? Hashtag um, R-U-S-A-F-E campaign. Um, this is designed to start real conversations about safety and asking women everywhere, um, are you really safe? This could be from walking home at night, taking public transport or navigating challenging relationships. We want to spark a meaningful dialogue and we do have um, four guest speakers who can help kickstart this conversation. This aligns with the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence starting from today and running for 16 days until the 10th of November. This global initiative will address gender-based violence and will hopefully promote safety. But first, I'd like to introduce um, the first speaker to briefly introduce himself, Samson, the co-founder co of I'm Safe. Um, would you like to introduce yourself and what inspired you to create the app first and foremost? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, great to connect with you all here. Uh, thank you for joining this uh, webinar. Uh, it's wonderful that you're here. I'll just take a few minutes to uh, give a brief background about I Am Safe. Um, as uh, Vivian uh, introduced, I'm Samson, one of the co-founders of I Am Safe. Uh, we basically run a uh, we're running a tech company, uh, a software development company, and somewhere around early 2020, we felt really passionate about using technology as a force for good towards women's safety. And coming from uh, South India, Chennai, I always wondered why India with the land of, uh, you know, a billion people, the, the land of tech gurus and tech giants, haven't cracked a solution for women's safety from a technology point of view. Yes, there's a lot of education and empowerment happens. A lot of webinars happen and they are needed. Uh, education does play a foundation role. But why haven't we used technology? Because technology is scalable. And that was the question uh, we as a core team at our company asked ourselves. And we said, okay, let's try to leverage technology and make a difference. And uh, while having these discussions, uh, we were, uh, you know, it was just around the COVID times. And we realized that uh, in India alone, in the first 11 days of lockdown, 91,000 child abuse cases was registered. And that's just 11 days in one country, India. So you can imagine, you know, the real cases and globally, what would be the scenario? You could run into millions of numbers. It was those numbers that drove us as a call to action to do something about it. Um, uh, United Nations says that one in three women are uh, go through abuse in their lifetime. But the real data in a country like 
you know, uh, India or uh, Australia, the real data could be much, much, much higher. Uh, and when we are talking about abuse, there are very, you, you all know as experts, there are levels of abuse and varieties of abuse. But what we want to do through uh, I'm saying, is first to give uh, every woman an opportunity to protect herself. There should no, be no woman on this planet Earth who did, does not have an opportunity to protect herself. That is a number one goal, which is why we have developed the ANSAFE app. And number two, when she is in need, she should be in a position to ask for help, which is one of our key uh, feature we have developed uh, is the ask for help where we connect with various NGOs and give the required help to the woman. So it is in this context around the United Nations 16 days of activism, we decided that you know, we all are, um, you know, very familiar with the, uh, with the word, are you okay? Where we ask our friends, we ask our colleagues, we say, are you okay? How are you doing today? Are you okay? But are you okay is a very broad, shallow and a generic question. We wanted to take that and say, how about we ask every woman in our life, are you safe? Because safety is a very important aspect for women. Most women do not come forward to tell they are unsafe. Most women hesitate to say because women by nature are very, um, you know, they, 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 are, they, they can handle a lot of tough situations. They are, they are built for that, right? Uh, they have the nurturing heart and they go through a lot of tough, tough things. So they don't always come forward and say, I need help. So we wanted to use these 16 days as an opportunity to initiate a conversation and ask every woman, are you safe? And that's what this campaign is all about. And uh, thank you so much for being part of this. Let's, uh, you know, make safety a normal in our generation. Let's bring a safety revolution. That's that's our, uh, a goal at I'm Safe because this is one area that hasn't changed much in 2000 years. Let's make a difference. And I'm sure together we can make a big difference. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Samson. That's a very um, passionate um, statement. And um, I think the app is such a wonderful development. And it is a situation where, unfortunately, we do need an app to protect women. Um, it would be better if we didn't need to. But I think the fact that it is designed, it means that everyone has a device and it is um, entirely accessible to everyone around the world. So I think making the world a safer, safer place one device at a time is our mission and um, hopefully it does make a difference no matter how big, how small. I think the um, the goal I think is a very strong one and Samson, well done and um, J Jason as well to drive this initiative. Okay, so um, let's uh, get into the flow of the webinar. We do have four guest speakers and we'll start by introducing you to our first speaker. So I'll just start off by introducing um, a bit of a background on um, Dr. Navina. Um, Dr. Navena is a renowned mental health specialist and advocate for dismantling stigma and breaking barriers in mental health care. Um, she holds an MBBS from um, a medical college um, in Chennai and has completed many um, certificate programs. She's very passionate about women's mental health, workplace wellness and addressing addiction disorders. Um, the approach combines mindfulness, positive psychology and holistic care to create an integrated solution for better mental well-being. Um, so Dr. Navina will share some insights into how mental health is intertwined with women's safety and empowerment. So um, Dr. Navina, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, so uh, it's wonderful to be here and thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity as well. Um, so I'm, I'm basically a psychiatrist and a mental health professional based in Chennai. And I have been in the field for uh, uh, about seven years now. Um, and like you mentioned, I am very interested in uh, women's mental health, uh, both uh, maternal uh, mental health as well as, I think, women's mental health in the workplace and uh, workplace wellness and safety and psychological safety uh, for people in general and women in specific because the set of challenges that they encounter tend to be unique. And um, Given the cultural background that we come from, especially in places like India and in Southeast Asia, where, you know, the uh, women are expected to play certain roles within the family as well. And uh, gender equality is still a long way off. Uh, but I think that, you know, we are making a lot of advancements uh, in terms of the opportunities uh, women are being given. But yet at the same time, the support system is yet to evolve. 
uh, to be able to, you know, um, let them make uh, complete use of those opportunities. So I think the set of challenges that women face are unique. Um, and that has always interested me. And uh, probably the, my own personal journey has also like, you know, um, sort of influenced me in taking a special uh, interest in this particular area because I have experienced it myself uh, and I know how, uh, you know, how systems work and uh, how uh, challenging it can be for women uh, to even uh, have their concerns validated, let alone, you know, find uh, safety or support or security. And if a person like me coming from a family privileged background and having like, you know, education, having the empowerment, if it, uh, if like, if I find it challenging, then I uh, it's, it's very hard to imagine what like, you know, millions of women must be going through who are in probably much more challenging situations and uh, who probably like, you know, uh, and uh, psychological threat by itself can be extremely disempowering. So when that threat becomes physical, uh, it is very hard to imagine the kind of adverse impact it can have on the well-being of a woman and also the kind of traumatic after effects that she has to like, you know, um, even after the imminent danger has passed, the, the impact doesn't go away. It takes a long time for her to be able to actually reconcile herself to whatever happened, to be able to integrate that. And sometimes I think people don't really even, uh, they probably don't acknowledge or recognize the fact that they're, they're living with trauma. And I think that uh, has a huge impact on their well-being, their relationships, and uh, even them living up to the potential that they could ideally live, live up to if they manage to heal that trauma. So th these are some of the thoughts that I've had over the years. And I uh, think that we are still in very nascent stages. Uh, I, I'm actually really happy with this team for working on uh, such a challenging area because I think it's not just about... Um, filling in a technological gap, I think that's actually the last link. So uh, before that, we have a lot of groundwork to do and uh, uh, where we actually build the kind of, you know, uh, infrastructure, not just in terms of technological or physical infrastructure, but there has to be a mental and social infrastructure in place where people are actually able to like um, have the information, the resources um, and the, the, the kind of the mindset to not just like uh, probably recognize um, threats to safety when it's happening or uh, any kind of danger or violence that's actually being perpetrated, but also to be able to like approach that and to be speak uh, to be able to speak up about it, to use the right channels to, uh, you know, like uh, escalate it if required. And also for other people to be able to support the individuals in the right way, to be able to actually discern what is go going on. Because the, uh, so especially when it comes to uh, uh, issues in the workplace or within intimate partner relationships, it's not always black and white. There are many, many shades of gray. And uh, sometimes it may be difficult to disentangle the uh, uh, different versions that may be going around. Uh, and uh, people often tend to like take sides and uh, sort of uh, probably have a reactionary response uh, rather than one that is objective and uh, you know one that also like uh, has empathizing and validating the uh, experiences of everybody that's involved people who are, you know they're more concerned about um, uh, probably uh, figuring out what is right and wrong rather than understanding that, you know, uh, uh, it's not just about right and wrong. It's about mm -hmm. like different people having different experiences of the same situation and about, uh, you know, like uh, uh, finding the ideal way to mediate and uh, probably to address everybody's experiences and resolve whatever has happened if it has happened. So I think that the, it's a very nuanced, very complex and intricate issue. And I think we need to probably do a lot of uh, ground level uh, research and also disseminate a lot of information to people about, uh, have a lot of talk uh, going about just like what you're doing at the moment. So mm -hmm. I think that is where the real challenge lies. Uh, because yeah. once we manage to open up the minds uh, both in terms of you know uh, recognizing it talking about it and also receiving it at the other end and being able to not uh, because i think that uh, 
now that women have started talking about it, systems have be, been functioning in a certain way. Society has been functioning in a certain way for centuries. And um, we st still, there are a lot of patriarchal underpinnings. And uh, now that we are bringing out, out all this in the open and discussions are happening and, you know, voices are being heard, there is also a certain level of threat that's being experienced. Uh, I think by society and systems that have learned to function in a certain way and, you know, that have found uh, some kind of security in the silence of women. So I think that mm. now that they're experiencing that threat, we need to also probably work on them also being able to, like, you know, change their mindsets. So it's not just, I think, the victims needing security, but I think that, you know, the people who are uh, who are probably, like, gotten comfortable abusing power or, you know, in some way are profiting from power uh, imbalances, uh, they are also going to push back and they're going to experience a lot of insecurity. And it, it takes a lot of, I think, very... Um, uh, tactful and diplomatic uh, uh, probably uh, conversations with such people to understand that, you know, empowering women, empowering people, uh, people who probably victimized in some way and mm. uh, having open discussions in the long run actually facilitates a more wholesome growth and uh, a more wholesome development of the system as a whole rather than, you know, minorities, which is what is happening at the moment. The people who are in power in one way or the other. Uh, so I think that, like, you know, uh, the work has to start from there, from conversations and from information and education and research. And, uh, you know, when when that that gets really accepted, then the technology is going to get accepted. But until the mm -hmm. mindsets change, there is going to be some level of resistance. So I think that for me, my work is cut out and, like, you know, uh, being able to reach those minds, uh, both the minds that are suffering as well as the minds that are not ready to probably acknowledge uh, suffering or, you know, that such problems do exist within our society, within the fabric of, you know, our workplaces, our families, our uh, relationships. And uh, it has happened that way for a lot of reasons. And yes, probably, you know, the, uh, that ha people have also benefited from it uh, in some way. Society has probably benefited from it in some way with, you know, women uh, t uh, going along with it and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, continuing to carry out their roles and fulfill their obligations uh, while not fighting. Yeah. For, you know, justice I... for themselves or, you know, whatever yeah. is being happening. Yeah. Very well said. Um, so I do believe as women, we can all relate to the fact that emotional well-being for us is extremely important. Um, and I think it's a very challenging um, thing to put ourselves in a position where we recognise that our mental health is deteriorating and we need to ask for help. So that's probably the first step, but it's probably the hardest barrier to break through. So what advice can you give women? So what are some early signs that we should look out for um, from our other peers and uh, what can we do about it to try to overcome that barrier? No, when, the, when there is a threat to safety, it could be uh, psychological or it could be physical. And it could be, uh, it could be perceived. It could be real. It could be as in real as in, uh, real in the environment. Or it, it could be perceived and real. I see it as, you know, I can it uh, into a real threat to physical or psychological safety in uh, the immediate environment. But uh, a person, uh, and in this instance, a woman could have a history where, you know, she might have had childhood trauma or she might have been abused in the past. And uh, she could be picking up signals in the current which uh, do not actually, you know, uh, necessarily... Um, uh, probably indicate uh, danger, but it could be that in her uh, mind, she could be link linking it to those past uh, experiences and she might be perceiving a uh, threat when there is no threat, but then she too is still experiencing uh, risk to her safety and her trauma and distress is also real. So I think that's the first category. And then there is the category where there is something happening in the environment, uh, be it in a relationship or in the workplace or in a public place, where there is uh, some uh, threat 
to the safety of a person and she is also having a history of you know like uh, uh, probably like having had such experiences in the past or maybe not and in either case her uh, perception of that event might uh, you know get um, uh, it might be magnified based on whatever she has already experienced but here there is a real threat and in the third scenario, it could be happening for the first time to a person and the threat could be of a larger uh, scale or it could be of a more immediate uh, consequence. So uh, in all these uh, scenarios, I think it's important that um, both the person that who's experiencing the threat as well as people who are in a position to reach out and help to the help the person uh, they should have a fairly good understanding of what is going on. So they're able to like, you know, both uh, ask for or advocate for help uh, as well as offer that help and uh, guide the person to the right resources. Uh, and so usually what happens is they, the person could be having an acute stress response where uh, it could be like, you know, an immediate uh, emotional distress. Uh, so if that is happening, then the ideal thing to do would be to like, you know, uh, give uh, mental uh, health first state. So uh, probably like, you know, de-escalate the situation at that time, give the uh, person some emotional support and, uh, you know, just validate their concerns. At that point, it's, it's you don't need to seek an immediate resolution. It's more important that the person be able, uh, be able to ex uh, probably put their experience into words and express whatever it is that they're feeling. And then if some time has elapsed, the person or if it's an ongoing stress or that, you know, some kind of continuous harassment or it's like uh, something that's relational and it has been uh, going on for months or years, then the person may be experiencing something like they might be undergoing depression or they might be undergoing anxiety. They might be having a post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, they may also uh, find it difficult to uh, talk about it because it is easier to talk about something that's sudden and uh, especially if you you have uh, you don't have a complex history as well but if something has been ongoing for a long period of time and it, maybe you are dependent and there is a power imbalance in the situation be it a uh, intimate partner uh, relationship or be it a workplace uh, maybe you're financially dependent maybe you're you know psychologically dependent there may be trauma bonding so in such cases it, it's going to be more difficult what is important is that somebody in the vicinity is seeing what is going on and even if the person themselves is uh, they are not able to immediately you know uh, advocate for themselves or they are not able to recognize that you know abuse is happening or harassment is happening if somebody else is able to uh, even give them the information in an objective way you know it's it's like you know planting that first seed and letting them know that help is available or like talking about their mental health in general without addressing the harassment or the abuse or uh, the violence or the aggression, if they could just say that, you know, I see that your mental health is not great and, you know, you seem to be depressed or you seem to be on the edge, you seem to be very anxious uh, or I notice that you're not sleeping well or you're not talking like you used to. If they could sort of reflect that a lot of times people become very disconnected when um, they're experiencing a lot of mental stress over a long period of time, they're often disconnected from their own emotions. So if somebody else could serve as that mirror and reflect to them uh, and, you know, point out to them what it, the change that they have been seeing in that person, that could be a starting point for that person's mental awakening where they realize, okay, you know, they are no longer the person they used to be and things have changed and there's something wrong that's going on. So, uh, yeah, the, uh, more chronic mental health concerns could also happen. And in the long run, there is also the physical impact because when you're mental, when you're under great deals of mental stress, you may be at a higher risk for inflammation in the body. You might be having some kind of autoimmune conditions. You might have cardiac issues. Uh, so, uh, depression uh, and, you know, uh, certain long-standing mental health issues could also have an impact. You may be having obesity. You might have, like, you know, hormonal imbalances. So, that could be something else. Sometimes it could be that the physical issues they present with point out to an underlying, uh, you know, mental health condition. So, that's something also that, you know, both the person as well as their loved ones or people who care about them should watch out for. Mm, definitely. Definitely um, good advice. Thank you, Dr. Navina, for um, your, I guess, um, your feedback and the ability to recognise the signs, but also being able to take action. I think even talking to someone in itself is the way that you can sort of take that first step to 
um, look for, uh, for support, but also it's th therapeutic in a way where when you do talk to someone who can listen to you, that can be your first step towards um, taking action, but also doing something to take care of your emotional well-being. The um, I'm Safe Women's Safety app does have a feature where women can reach out to a helpline. Um, and that helpline can put you in touch with the resources in your area that so that you can ask for help, um, provide you with the right contacts and resources so that way you can talk through your um, concerns and they'll be actively able to help you. There are sometimes counsellors on board to um, help them in that situation as well. So overcoming that mental barrier, I think, initially is um, the hardest part, but there is um, that useful tool in the app. Um, so I'd like to now um, move on to our next speaker. Thank you, uh, Dr. Navina. So just um, introducing uh, Ms. Chrysalite Sanamanda, the Executive Director of the Red Rope Movement. Um, she's a dedicated leader in the fight against human trafficking. She has made some amazing accomplishments, including um, leading interstate cycling campaigns to raise awareness, organising global and um, synopsis and establishing partnerships of over 30 organisations to protect victims and dismantling trafficking network. Um, are you there, Miss Chris Light? Hi, can you hear me? Hi, yes, we can hear you fine. Thank you so much for joining us um, this afternoon. Um, we might get you to start off by introducing yourself uh, and what's inspired you to be part of the Red Brick Movement. Uh, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, it's um, such a joy to be here this afternoon uh, to talk about uh, safety, to talk about uh, women, and to talk about uh, nonviolence or non-discrimination against women. Um, I want to thank, first of all, uh, I am safe for this uh, initiative and to talk about uh, are you safe? instead of asking or shifting our focus from are you okay or how are you doing to are you safe so really appreciate the efforts of i am safe and um, the whole team for coming up with this uh, uh, unique uh, or yet very simple uh, but profound statement of asking are you safe um, I'm Chrysalite. I'm representing Red Rock Movement. We work on anti-human trafficking for the past five years. Our forte has been on prevention. We also do a few rescues wherever there is a request for. However, for the past two years, we've been working on repatriation of international victims of human trafficking. Um, one common thing that we notice all through is victims do not know where to report. And even before going to becoming a victim, understanding whether this is an incident of exploitation or whether this is an incident of manipulation or deception, to ask somebody those clarifications is something that is missing, right? And if you notice, traffickers, I mean, the whole world is growing. Trafficking has become online. Technology, um, communication, um, while everything has been run by technology and communication, we as social workers or we as social organizations or we as government, we are kind of slagging behind in using technology to make that difference or to, to be there and to be available. So I believe um, what I am safe has come up with is such a unique yet much needed uh, initiative in reaching out to the people and to being available to people uh, through the technology and through communication. So today, my call is to all women. And it's so beautiful to share uh, the forum with women. Uh, while they say that women, the enemy of a woman is a woman. And here we are, a group of women trying to make the difference or trying to break that stereotype or stigma against women, by women, of women, right? So it's such a joy to just share the forum with um, women. I kept thinking about it. He, why should we have women? Why not have men? But the statement stu stood um, uh, strong with me that women standing for women makes a whole world of difference. Just saying that you're not alone, I'm with you. Right. So today my call is to all the women, when in doubt, when you're unsure, 
when you are unsafe, when you're not okay, when anything that is beyond your confidence or beyond your um, surety, I think you should just log into I am safe, get those clarifications by professionals, by counselors, by people that are just available to have that conversation and get guidance. You know, I think there is this proverb that says, there is wisdom in a council of counselors or in a group of counseling. So there is no harm whether you accept, whether you work, whether, whether you work on the suggestions being made or not. But there is absolute wisdom in just seeking advice or just seeking seeking knowledge from people. So today my call is at any point in time, you're unsure of a relationship or of a boyfriend, somebody's stalking you, somebody, somebody trying to take advantage of you, whether it is a cyber fraud, whether it is a uh, financial fraud. My challenge to all of you or my request to all of you is just get on the app. You don't have to download the app. Just scan the app, scan the QR code, ask for help. I am a firm believer of prevention. Prevention is, is million dollar cure, uh, million dollar um, initiative than being providing cure. So, and all of us have experienced that during the pandemic. We've seen how much prevention can make a difference. And that is exactly what we are trying to do. Prevent the crime. So if at all you find yourself in any of the situations, ask for help. Now, what if the situation has already occurred to you? We are still here. You can still ask for help. Find ways on how you can just get onto the QR code or just get onto the helpline and ask for help. Why is this important? And especially for a cause like human trafficking. Like I was saying, traffickers are highly technical and highly advanced in using technology and communication. But we as organizations, we are not there yet. And I think I am safe as trying to bridge that gap and bring all the organizations together on one forum. And this is so unique. And I really thank I am safe for doing this. So, and I want and this call is also for organizations, for social workers, for advocates to come under this one umbrella and to leverage the technology and leverage the app to reach out to the people in need. So many of the victims do not knowing where to go for help, not knowing whom to ask for advice, not knowing where to get their doubts clarified, have fallen into the trap of human trafficking. And hence, it's a call or an, it's, a, it's an initiative for all of those questions and clarifications to be made. Secondly, if you have already fallen a victim of anything, whether it is cyber, uh, somebody trying to, trying to blackmail you with your own information or with your own pictures, here is an app that can help you bridge that gap, right? So there is a difference from being a victim to going to becoming a complainant, right? And here is an app trying to bridge that difference or bridge the gap by equipping each one of us on how to do complaints. What is the best way to solve the problem that you're facing? And if you're alone, if this problem is just yours or, or do we have resources available? So I want to encourage all of us to be more technically sound in, in ensuring that we are safe, being cognizant of, of how much we are leveraging te the technology. When we are leveraging the technology for our benefits, for our uh, entertainment, for our um, uh, fulfillment, I think it's also important that we leverage the technology for our safety. And here is I am safe for, for that. So I wanna encourage all of us, organizations, colleges, um, NGO partners, government, international partners to leverage this unique opportunity of bridging communication and technology to bring out the awareness in people. Definitely. I think um, that's the key point. We need more awareness. And I love the fact that you mentioned that, you know, 
we as organizations you are limited with resources and tech may not be um, at your advantage but Samson and his team has built I'm Safe, which is a uh, tech for good. So being able to use that um, with all your contacts and get the um, the awareness out there. So I think everybody, um, you know, telling your sisters, your friends, um, people, women that you know, I think it's just having that conversation and letting them know that this app exists. And if it's a um, situation where they need it, then it's uh, simple to use. Um, you know, it has everything, a powerful app that is required to get the help they need and to arm themselves in situations where they may be in danger. So I think um, it is a very complex issue with human trafficking, but I feel hopefully that if this app can help in any way, then we'll love to just try to get the word out and together I think we can amplify that message. So thank you so much, uh, Ms. Chrysolite. I appreciate your passionate plea to everybody and I think we are onto um, a great movement with your um, dedication on board. Um, I'd like to now move on to our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Fazana, um, she is a dedicated advocate for women's rights and she's the head of programs at Operations Peacemaker and My Choices Foundation. Um, she brings over 15 years of experience working on issues related to gender, patriarchy and violence against women and instrumental in mobilizing communities to address gender-based violence and plays a pivotal role in international advocacy for change. Um, Dr. Fazana, are you there? Yes, yes, Vivian, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us today. appreciate your time. I'll get you to also introduce yourself and talk about um, what you do for the organization. Yeah, so um, I'm really glad to be here today. And uh, I'm, uh, as you mentioned, that uh, uh, last 15 years I have been uh, working uh, to ensure that uh, women and girls are safe. Uh, and this resonates very well what... Uh, uh, the team uh, I'm safe team is doing uh, the 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 most basic human right question like uh, are are women safe are our girls are safe uh, so in these 15 years of experience uh, working with various uh, communities organizations and you know demographies I understood this very clearly that safety is the the biggest concern for women as a as a human being. Uh, and that that even that basic rights are being violated every day. So uh, in my work with My Choices Foundation, actually uh, very focusedly and dedicatedly, we work on two very uh, vast issues. One is uh, prevention of uh, domestic violence and child sexual abuse. And I represent that uh, part of My Choices Foundation. And we have another big movement uh, that is the prevention of uh, uh, human trafficking, especially for uh, uh, girls and women for commercial sexual exploitation. Uh, and that has a dedicated team for that. Uh, so working with women and girls uh, in prevention of domestic violence and child sexual abuse, uh, in these years, uh, I learned that uh, uh, we have to really work hard uh, to educate the the community is not just the, the the women and girls, but the entire community. We have to shift uh, the 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 thinking and the norms uh, that put women in danger, and uh, we have to work with entire you know ecosystem. It's not just uh, women and girls. And in my choices foundation, actually, we have two. Uh, we have many strategies, but two significant point uh, is one is the prevention aspect, because definitely uh, I agree with the Chris Light that prevention is better than cure. So we have a very dedicated department of the prevention work where we work very closely with the men and women and girls and the communities and boys, everybody like, you know, community leaders from institutions, uh, partners on a, on a moment bu uh, building on the prevention aspect. But uh, we also have a dedicated department for response work, which we call interventions. And in interventions, we have a counseling department so that the, the women or families who go through violence and abuse, they can have a safe place where they can uh, they can be healed, they can be provide support to overcome. Uh, uh, and then the, the, we really help them to navigate this uh, issue. 
and then uh, we have a dedicated team of lawyer also who uh, many a times when the counseling is not the solution then we have to take the matter in court uh, so we we lies with the uh, police department also very closely we work with them so that uh, the uh, the required uh, interventions can be done on the legal side and our lawyers are filing the cases in the courts to get the reliefs under the domestic violence act 2005 and other various laws and then we have a safe home also a short stay where home where women can stay with children if uh, they are in need because very critical for women if she would like to raise her voice she want to seek a support the immediate threat is that she is thrown out of the house and in that particular house when she is not safe where she will go so that is the very compelling thing that uh, that puts the survivor again back into that abusive situation because she has no place to go and that's where in 2018 we started a small uh, safe home where women can stay with the children and uh, then uh, we have other initiatives but these are the major two work that we are uh, undertaking yeah. mm, definitely the topic of domestic violence it's um increasing um globally and i think it's important like you mentioned that um it starts with a conversation ask asking people to come up and um advocate for themselves and be able to say i need help and um, being able to find the resources they need to connect them to people like yourself to give them um, shelter or to give them contacts to, um, to, to help them in their situation. So I think it's definitely a much needed um, role. So how do you think um, domestic violence, of course, can happen to anyone, but why are we specifically talking about women? I mean, it can happen to men as well, but I think statistically it is um, proven that women are definitely um, more higher likely to be um, undergoing domestic violence? Yes, uh, Vivian, uh, I agree with you that uh, violence can happen to anyone. I mean, every human is uh, prone to violence. But uh, when we talk about women and uh, when we talk about domestic violence or violence against women in general, uh, that I think uh, it's worth mentioning here what United Nations Declaration on Elimination of Violence Against Women describe that it is a manifestation of historically unequal power relationships between men and women. And this unequal power dynamics between men and women put women uh, in a place of subordination. And uh, this is a more about power and control. So uh, it's, that's why this inequality, this power thing uh, between men and women significantly contribute to the occurrence of domestic violence. Uh, basically, it's a direct outcome, you can call, say, of power and control, where uh, in a patriarchal society where men are considered to be more, you know, uh, they are patriarch, like uh, the women and children should be under them. Uh, so this basically this uh, and it's not a uh, just Indian or South Asian or Asian concept, but worldwide, globally, this is a this is a issue of patriarchy, uh, power and control. So that's why when we talk, uh, because globally, if you see the data, like you know, uh, Indian data as well as the international data from the WHO or UN Women or even our own very. Uh, wide scaled surveys of uh, National R Crime Records Bureau or a uh, National Family Health Surveys. National F H H Family Health Survey, which is a widespread across India survey, it says close to 40% married women go through domestic violence. Uh, the, the, the WHO data said uh, one in three women globally goes through intimate partner violence. Uh, it's a very shocking to, you know, see these uh, statistics when, uh, you know, in every 10 minute when women is killed by somebody, majority of the time is a close to the, either is a family member or somebody very close to her. So I think if we put the this statistics and this theory and this system in context, then we will be able to understand that why uh, it is so important to talk about violence against women. Uh, why uh, we cannot equate the violence that men go through to the what women go through because it's a systematic it is a systematic operation it's a very uh, system driven uh, across the globe so i think uh, and especially you know 
the uh, we were we were very shocked because sometimes we feel that is the it, these talks are from the past days but in fact in a recent survey we uh, we came across one data which was very alarming where more than 50% of women girls and men and boys uh, accepted that in some situations husband can beat wife and it is a justified act of you know masculinity so now when we put these uh, in a, you know context uh, these things in context then we understand that why it is important why when we are working at centers also we we dealt more than 19000 cases of domestic violence and mm -hmm. we resonate very well like you know why uh, the issue of violence against women is so critical, so crucial, so systematic that uh, uh, these efforts are not even, uh, you know, a drop of uh, drop in the ocean. The amount of violence and abuse women go through. So, mm. yeah, yes, in that light, yeah. I would like to say that, you know, why it is important to talk about it and work on these issues on a war yeah, Basis. It's a very uh, sensitive, but um, it does affect everybody. I think globally, as you mentioned, um, there is a lot of, I'm sure, a lot of stories that you've seen on your um, you know, day to day role, unfortunately, that it does come up. And we do have a PowerPoint that we've seen from you that we can share with the audience afterwards. Um, it's pretty, I guess, um, highlighting to, you know, important to see everything that can occur against crime against women. Um, and I think when it comes to the I'm Safe Women Safety app, with our features such as the anonymous recording, where in case of an emergency under DV, women are able to take a form of control by documenting a situation confidentially. Um, that is something um, that as a feature that we can provide. And that way, if they do decide to leave an abusive um, relationship, then in, there is the evidence that they can um, use um, for legal matters down the court. So it's just having these tools that sit in your device that you can have in these very sensitive um, situations and hopefully we can um, hopefully make an impact in some way. So uh, thank you for um, um, sharing us with your insights. Um, I will also like to now go to our next speaker. Um, our final speaker for today is Mrs. Selvi. Um, she's highly respected advocate um, and head of programs Oh, no, sorry, hang on. Mrs. Selby, got the wrong person here. Mrs. Selby is an international advocate with the Every Woman Treaty Coalition and instrumental in advocating for policy reform and supporting women and children through legal expertise. Um, so it'll be interesting to get your insight to discuss the role of a legal advocate to ensure justice and protection for women against violence and abuse. Um, so, Mrs. Selby, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate your time um, with us this afternoon. Um, I'll get you to introduce yourself and how um, you, you can help women when it comes to legal matters. So being a lawyer, being a woman, I come across a lot of issues. Uh, time again. I was just thinking of what is the root cause for this, uh, whatever is happening, <clears throat> why it's happening, what is happening and why it's happening. I have a PowerPoint, I will send it across if you would like to display or we can just have a, a talk, you just let me know. So we will say if you uh, display that will also be nice. Okay, so <clears throat> will you uh, be able to share that? Let's see if I can bring that up and we can share the PowerPoint. Just give me a moment. Yeah. Yes, you display and uh, keep talking. See, on a daily basis, around 51 FIRs of crime against women are getting registered. So in 2022, there are around four and a half lakh cases, registered cases. There are unregistered cases must be much more than what has been registered. So over a period of time, around the three decade of my practice, three decade of my uh, being in the profession. So I was thinking, what is what is the cause? Why such things are happening? 
And it is, why is it so rampant? You know, that's what I uh, just want to bring in uh, two recent cases. Okay. That is one about this Hatua uh, Array case. We all, we all read about it. A little girl was raped inside a temple. Then there's another case. It was on Atras. There, this girl should not give evidence. They cut her tongue. And this, yes, they, the body was not given to the parents. The police themselves came in the middle of the night and they burned it. Very, very recent case, even till like, uh, doctors are protesting about a postgraduate student, <clears throat> a doctor in Calcutta. She was raped and killed. So these are all reported cases. There was this nurse who went on to become a nursing uh, professor. So she was telling me initially when she became a nurse, she was posted in primary health centers uh, in villages, right? She's saying on a daily basis, two, three cases of women raped and they are in a dying condition, they are brought to the hospitals. That has never been reported. And they die in those primary health centers. So this is a situation in India right now. Why? What is the problem with our society? We have this <clears throat> Indian female code, which came, which gave some protection to women in 1860. Prior to that, there was no any law that gave protection to women. Now we have like, in India we have something like acid attack. If a girl, a boy goes and proposes a girl, if she says no, they just throw acid on her. Rape, attempt to commit rape, <coughs> kidnapping, dowry death. It's very, very, very specific to our country. Cruelty by husband and relatives. Outraging modesty of women. Sexual harassment. All these. <clears throat> crimes against women. There is this law. Which came in 1860. Which indicates... It came during the British era. Prior to that, during the king's time, what was it? Did she get protection if she was raped? Did she get protection if there was a cruelty against her by her husband or relative? Cruelty is a norm. <clears throat> cruelty against women was a norm before 1860. Before 1860, any law came. In India, we had a law called Mullakaram. Breast tax in one of the princely states in India. Tiruvedanpur Samasthanam. If women have to wear blouse, upper clothes, she has to wear, she has to pay tax. Women who come from landholding families or a woman uh, coming from a family having income, they were able to pay tax. But the lowest class were not given any salary. They worked in the field, agricultural field, day and night. The concept of salary was not there. So they could not pay tax. So they had to go around. They have to live without upper clothes. It was very accepted norm that women are 
being treated that way. It was it was very normalized thing. Then we have had this Devadasi system. In the Devadasi system, you had young girls sent to temple compounds. In the temple compound, the priest and the land holding men, they could come and sleep with her. It's norm. She's not paid anything. She's supposed to give service. Then the highest form of cruelty is sati, widow burning. If the husband dies, they would just simply throw the women on the pyre of her husband. Nothing. They felt wrong in it. It's only when William Carey, he saw, he felt aghast. What's happening? How can you, you know, throw a live person on the fire? He took steps to change that. If you can just scroll down, the uh, I think I have finished all these things. The Indian awesome. penal code protection, you know, these are the uh, uh, socially accepted cruelty on women. Okay, there is this. <clears throat> if you could read, you can see a, a story of Nangeli that is about uh, uh, how the tax system existed for women to wear upper clothes. The Evdasi system was abolished in 1947. Who played a major role? There is this Amy Carmichael. She came to India and she saw that little girls were given for in the name of Devdasi or servant of God. They were given to prostitution. Not even prostitution. Prostitute gets to gets some money for the for her services. Now, for example, I worked abroad as a, a professor. There, it is an African country. There, this man from India, he was a colleague. He was also appointed in the same uh, place where I was working. This fellow had gone to a prostitute and he just walked off. He didn't pay her. That girl could go and file a complaint that we had agreed this much of money and this fellow did not pay. And immediately the police sent a note to the university saying that one of your staff has done this. And immediately he was removed from the job and he was sent back. Had this similar situation happened in India, the same guy had gone and slept with someone and walked off and the girl would have not got any relief from anywhere. She can't go to the police station. She can't go and tell anyone. But there was an African country that girl had that protection. Because our system has normalized that they can do anything and they can just walk away. If you are raped, that you have to be ashamed of. It is not the man. It is a man who is uh, who is committing this crime. He should be ashamed of. But it is not that way. It is attuned in our mind that you know, I have to be ashamed because I got it. This is the mentality in which or a culture or a normalized situation that we are living in. You can just scroll down. The You can see Amy Carmichael. See, look at the uh, 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 children who are sent into uh, Devadasi system. The priest would sleep with these children. Uh, uh, she rescued all these children from the temple compound and she gave them a place. There's a settlement village even today it is there, Donaur. So that is the village in which she accommodated all these women, gave them education. They became first generation teachers. 
later in life. So these are the things, some interventions came. The next uh, uh, slide will show about the women being carried to be burned with a dead husband's fire. This was very normal. People didn't feel bad about burning somebody alive. It's very normalized. So this is the situation. Even today, if you go to uh, Brindavan, Mathura, there are places where you would see all these women who lost their husband. They are thrown out of the house. They have to go and live in that place. If you see, watch this movie. Water. You will know there are as young as like five-year-old widows. You will find them there. Now they are not killing them because there is an abolition of <coughs> sati. Now they are just simply throwing them out of the home because she lost her. We watch this movie. This is again another movie. Candle in the Dark, where he worked hard to stop this practice of sati. So these are the things which is which is really normal, normalized, normal. Now new kinds of crimes have come, cyber crimes. Just because you say no to someone, if somebody wants to marry, and if uh, you say no, then you they are, you are being harassed in public spaces like Facebook. And cyber stalking is happening. This is another kind of crime. All these, most of them are not reported. There's one woman who came from Tamil Nadu. There, there was this uh, one punishment happened. This is the first cyber crime conviction of two years of jail and 4,500 rupees was awarded. How many women go, go out and take a stand and file a complaint? and get some remedy. Another case is again about cyber stalking. You, without your knowledge that your photo being moved and your photo is being put on there, then again they harass you. This, all this thing has become so normalized. Whose fault is that? Is it women's fault, men's fault? Or even as mothers, how we are bringing up our children, how we bring them up to respect women. As parents, are we bringing them up to respect women? Is it our culture, very normalized culture to get such kind of a harassment, even to the point of burning your life? It's normalized. The latest case of Sati happened in Rajasthan. All those who were involved, their latest judgment just three weeks ago came. All those who were involved in Sati, they were all acquitted. That woman was bound up. There was this woman. She got into an affair with her boss. He was an already married man. This man was telling her to go through abortion every time she gets married. She went through eight abortions. And the ninth time he was telling her to abort, she filed a case under domestic violence. And the judge who is sitting there, you are not legally wedded wife, so you cannot claim domestic violence under this act. That girl did not get relief. Because the judge who is sitting there is not seeing the suffering of the women. He is seeing that you are the other women. Other women is a woman. She is still a citizen of this country. The judge is not seeing like that. In a case of uh, 
I provide you with a case, uh, case name. And women judge from Bombay. She is saying molestation. If somebody fondles your breast over your blouse, then it is not molestation. This is how she gave judgment. How come? This is a woman who is sitting there, women judge is giving his judgment, saying that, you know, it's only a skin to skin contact is there, then it is molestation. This is what is happening in our country. It is ha has been happening for thousands of years. The law came in Spain. When the Britishers came, they brought in law. Some protection was given, but it is not followed. Mm. That's a, so many devastating stories. I'm sure you've seen so many of them, but hopefully by bringing awareness, then we can start educating people and encourage some action from these heinous crimes. Discuss about it. I'm, I'm very thankful that you created this forum to talk about it. Mm. I think we need to yes. have more spaces where we can talk about all these things. Definitely. I think there's a lot to do. Um, this is one out of many steps that um, needs to be taken, but I applaud yourself, all women um, who take such a strong role in advocating for women's rights. It's, uh, it's been happening for many years and we're hoping over time that this um, can improve. And with the I'm Safe Women Safety app, it's not going to um, fix everything, but it is something that women should all have um, in their device. It's free to download. So hopefully by having it and being able to encourage all women to download it to use when the situation arises, then it makes a difference. Um, so I think we've uh, summarized, I guess, all of our speakers for tonight. And um, I really do appreciate every single one of you for coming and talking to us this afternoon. We've covered so many topics from emotional well-being to human trafficking, um, you know, We've got domestic violence and the legal side of things as well. They're all critical matters in the overall topic of gender-based violence. And now with the UN's 16 days of um, in fighting against gender violence, I'm hoping that we can continue this conversation, sharing insights. Everyone, everyone has their areas of expertise that they can also sh uh, share and um, being able to encourage women to come out and um, being part of that uh, movement to um, also help other women that they know that may need um, some support. We have a call to action for everybody. We invite you to join in our Are You Safe campaign. You can visit our website and the, um, you, uh, the website link for that is areyousafe.co, R-U-S-A-F-E dot C-O. Um, from there, you'll be able to find out more about our movement. Um, it runs for 16 days on the 25th of November to 10th of December. However, we do want to keep the conversation going for as long as possible. So it doesn't matter if this campaign ends, we still are there to be able to offer support for women everywhere to generally raise awareness. We have um, plenty of resources that you can tap into. Um, our Ask for Help feature is available via the app or through desktop as well. So that would be um, a first step for many women who uh, are unaware of how they can take that first initial step to try to seek assistance and be guided to um, the right direction. Um, so again, our call to action is to join our movement. Um, we encourage you to go onto the website. We do have a list um, of all these assets that people can download, whether it's posters or social media templates um, or flyers. They've been pre-made, so we encourage you to access them to send them through to your social media contacts, um, through your email contacts, and invite them to join our movement. The more we spread the awareness, the more conversation we have, then it's the better for us. So starting again with the question, are you safe? Um, I think that is a very critical um, and meaningful conversation we can start. So overall, I think together as a whole, women and men, we can create a safer world for women. So let's keep the conversation going beyond this webinar. And I'd also like to say a special thank you to the men who are helping us behind the scene. Of course, you know, we're talking about women who are impacted, but we've got wonderful people like um, Samson, Jason, 
who have been involved in building this app. And if it wasn't for their initiative to build this meaningful and powerful app, then we don't know what else, you know, we could do about their support. So I think it's um, a powerful app and we really need to get the word out so that way they can try and get it into the right hands. And if you want to find out more about that, then look into the website, women.imsafe, I-M-S-A-F-E dot app. And it tells you about all the features you can access, um, such as making fake calls, having anonymous recording, GPS locations, asking for help. There are so many useful features for women um, anywhere in the world to use, and we encourage them to access it and to, um, to use it and also give us feedback and um, hopefully try to improve it. So this um, brings us to the end of our webinar. We, again, thank everybody for jumping on board and spending their time with us this afternoon. Um, if anybody would like a copy of the recording, then please um, let us know. We can send you the recording for afterwards and you can, uh, again, share that with um, your contacts as well. So thank you, everybody, and um, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. <laughs>